I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Could the Duluth Superior Port be part of the solution to supply chain issues here in the U.S.? We'll have more on the port's beefed up container handling capability. The Northland Foundation's annual report puts a spotlight on some of the key issues facing our region. We'll have more with Foundation President and CEO Tony Sertich. And Marshall Helmberger from the Timber Jay and Tower is our guest on Voices of the Region. Those stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Denny, the trick-or-treaters are getting ready for the weekend and getting their costumes ready to go. I'm getting my costume ready. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who I will be portraying. Are you going as Dennis Anderson? I might. Ah, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Let's start right. with the headlines. All right. Thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And the University of Wisconsin Superior Campus has reached a 70% vaccination goal now of its students. Superior is the 10th UW system school to reach the vaccine threshold. Vaccinated students on campuses that reach that goal are eligible for one of 70 $7,000 scholarships. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development has awarded a $2 million grant to the city of Cohasset. The money will help extend sewer and water lines to the Huber Woods Oriented Strand Board facility. Funding from the state and the IRRB will help build the plant, which will employ more than 150 workers. The last major traffic change on the big can of worms rebuilding project will occur on Monday. The ramp from I-535 northbound to I-35 will be closed for demolition. Beginning that day, tourists will be detoured from Superior across the Bong Bridge to get to northbound I-35. And 10 years after the Pagami Creek Forest Fire rendered it impassable, the Forest Service and Boundary Waters Advisory Committee will celebrate the Pow Wow Trail Restoration. The event will be held Saturday at the Forest Center in Stony River Township. Volunteers have contributed more than 7,000 hours, clearing more than 20,000 fallen trees from the trail due to the fire. Well, news from the Duluth Seaway Port Authority could bring some relief to container backlog on the coasts. A record backlog of cargo ships is reportedly impacting our nation's supply chain and economic growth. Amidst the news, Duluth's Kluwer Public Marine Terminal now has the ability to handle significantly larger volumes of international shipping containers via vessels. Joining us now to discuss what all this means for the shipping industry in our region and beyond is Deb DeLuca, director of the Duluth Seaway Port Authority. Deb, thank you very much for being with us. Welcome to Almanac North tonight. You know, over the years, we have heard so much here in the Twin Ports about bulk cargo moving in and out of the ports. Uh, containerized cargo is something different. What is it? Well, the containerized cargo is the, is the you've, we've all seen the shipping containers and we've certainly all heard a lot about them <laughs> over this past year, which has been plagued with supply chain issues. So shipping containers are a standard size box, you know, metal box, uh, that can be moved seamlessly between trains, trucks, and ships to, to you know, the, to move cargo on the global, throughout the global marketplace. The ones we see here in the Twin Ports, what do they contain? Well, we, we, there are two kinds of containers that you, you that you have been able to see in the past at our terminal. We do have an intermodal terminal for road and rail, that so that you can see the containers that move on road and rail, and those are the standard shipping containers, right at our terminal. But in terms of water, uh, in the recent past, we've we received containers. Um, in fact, the picture that you have up right now is is a picture of our intermodal terminal yard. Um, but in the recent past, the only kind of containers we could receive by water were the ones that, uh, if you think about those huge pieces of general cargo that you get, we get at our terminal, those are those uh, big pieces, like the big wind turbine components, like mm -hmm. the tower right. sections and the blades. Well, those have to come with parts to put them together, right? And those parts get put in a container. And so those parts associated with the, with the project cargo uh, is, is all we could get in containers by water. Now we can get essentially an endless array of um, raw materials, finished goods, semi-finished goods, foodstuffs, retail items. You name it is there. Yeah, <laughs> by water in a container. Wow. Yeah. So what recent investments or improvements 
have been made that have really expanded the port's ability to handle that containerized um, cargo? So we've been working over the past few years really, mm -hmm. uh, or it's been a multi-year project to build out the facility and the infrastructure needed to um, to accommodate the regulatory requirements of our of our partners that to you know to, in terms of homeland security um, uh, mm -hmm. requirements mm -hmm. and so we've did, we, and then we've been working with our partners to cross those T's and dot those I's and make sure we're all ready mm -hmm. and that, that and that's what allowed us to get to the point where we could announce we've crossed those I's and or crossed those T's and dotted those I's mm -hmm. so now that you're at that point and the word has gotten out and there's such a backlog on the coastal ports. Are you getting a lot of inquiries from shippers who are interested in maybe coming inland? Well, it's interesting that you asked that. We were only able to announce this, I think it was last week, mm -hmm. and we are in the middle of a lot of interesting conversations, but it takes a long time to bend supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, um, we, we are expecting to see our first ships. We could get one now. I mean, we're capable of taking one now, but we probably won't see one until next spring. Um, and you asked what sorts of opportunities there are. Well, think about it. We are the furthest um, inland seaport in North America. So now you can move those containers all the way into the, almost to the midpoint of the North American continent near major uh, Midwest, upper Midwest markets. You know, we're, we're close to, um, uh, you know, you name it, Chicago, Milwaukee, obviously the Twin Cities, but Des Moines, Omaha, uh, the, Fargo Moorhead. Mm -hmm. So now we can move those those containers all the way inland for distribution by by truck or rail yeah. to markets in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Debson's very large container ships are simply too big to fit through exactly. the St. Lawrence Seaway. How realistic is it to see a huge business increase in containerization here? That's such a great question. And so what we're, what we, if you want to look at this in terms of those those global supply chain disruptions, this is like a pressure relief valve for those coastal ports, this, the, the issues that we're seeing on the coastal ports. The, those huge vessels that you get at, you know, at the coastal ports, right. they, can't get pay, they can't get into the seaway. Those, those ships can get as far as Montreal or Halifax. So we'll, we'd see one of two things, either a direct feeder service on smaller, what we call seaway max vessels directly into our terminal, or uh, ships uh, transloading from the big ships, um, or transloading containers from the big ships to the seaway max vessels at Montreal or Halifax, and then they'd come in to our, to our mm -hmm. terminal. Part of the problem leading to the backlogs at the coastal ports has been a uh, shortage of dock workers, shortage of truck drivers, um, not just not being able to move it once it gets right. there. Are you having some of those same issues here, seeing workforce shortages that are starting to impact the ability to, to receive cargo here in the Twin Ports? And again, another great question. What, you know, there's workforce issues throughout this region, mm -hmm. right? But we have not seen those workforce, we don't have those issues at our terminal. Um, and we're able to be very efficient. You know, again, we're never going to be at one of those gigantic container terminals, but we can manage what we have, and we we have a sufficient workforce. And in terms of the truck, the the truck work, truckers workforce, they are definitely challenged regionally. I don't want to say they're not, but mm -hmm. they've done a really. We, they've never failed to to deliver for us. And you know, don't forget that we are all, we are already a multimodal logistics hub with truck, four class yeah. one railroads, warehousing facilities. So we have tr we are always moving cargo in and out of our terminal, and the they're port, always delivering. The port took a hit last year with the pandemic. Uh -huh. How are you doing this year? Oh, we're having a really great rebound year, and you're absolutely right. I think it was I think we had the lowest um, tonnage through the Port of Duluth Superior in since decades. 1938. I think I really think it was 1938 that was the. The, the last lowest point. And so this year has been, a, in that, you know, it's all caused by dis disruption in, in supply chains, sure. uh, supply and dema demand. Uh, but so this year we're seeing a great rebound. We're, I think we're uh, ahead of our five year average by about a little over 3% at the end of September for total tonnage. And that's really driven by iron ore, a really strong market for steel this year, which is driving demand for iron ore. And I think we're, we're, we were at ahead of the five-year average by 16%. Also, I mean, interestingly, cement is ahead of the five-year yeah. average by 70%. Wow. That's coming in to the port, and uh, you, you, know, you just have to look at all the construction that's going on in the region. We had one shipment that, went, uh, that was delivered as far away as Alberta of cement, which I think, again, illustrates the great reach of our, of our port. Uh, we have great access to those uh, upper Midwest markets. Mm -hmm. including and Canada. Any of us who uh, make 
regular trips uh, across the bridge over into Wisconsin know about the ongoing construction at the, the Twin Ports interchange. Uh, the port is right there in the thick of things. How has that been impacting um, the ability to move cargo in and out? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm glad you asked that too. Uh, we have a new building, as you know, and mm -hmm. it faces right on Garfield. So depending on which of our staff you're talking to, they, they have a front row <laughs> seat right on that traffic. And, um, it, you know, that, that is an industrial area. There's a lot, even, even without the, the, the truck reroute, there's a lot of industrial, uh, there's a lot of big semis carrying big loads that go through that area. And, we, and unfortunately, with all the added traffic, there's, I, we've seen some very, uh, I just want to remind people to be safe and careful when they're driving through there because the, mm -hmm. they need to be aware of those big loads mm -hmm. are going to be present. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's definitely increased congestion. We're able to get our, our goods in and out, but some of our industrial partners have been really, they, they, you know, they, they've, they've been, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to be extra careful, but they've, there's been some near incidents down on the, in the, in the area. So, so Deb, what's the employment picture like at the port? Oh, well, uh, our terminal is doing really well. And the other, the, do you mean in terms of workforce? Yes. Well, workforce, it's, gr it's great you asked that. We've talked to our terminal partners. There's, there's about 21 active terminals in the harbor. And for the most part, they're able to meet their, their workforce demand. Um, some of the ones that do some manufacturing also in association may have a hard time finding, say, a welder or an electrician. But um, they're, they're able to meet their workforce yeah. needs, and our terminal has been able to meet our Wonderful. workforce needs. Wonderful. And with that, we have to leave it alone. <laughs> Deb DeLuca, who is the Executive Director of Duluth Port Authority, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Deb. Take care. It's time now for Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist covering stories of interest in the Northland. This week, Marshall Helmberger, publisher of the Timberjay newspaper in Tower, is our guest. We're reporting on the latest decision regarding the proposed uh, Twin Metals Copper Nickel Mine near Ely. Uh, which suffered another blow on Wednesday. Uh, that's when the Bureau of Land Management informed the company that they are canceling a mineral lease application uh, along with the prospecting permit applications that they had also filed. And, and all of those uh, applications had been initiated under the Trump administration and appeared to be moving forward relatively quickly. It comes just a week after the uh, BLM had announced that the Forest Service had initiated a with, uh, mineral withdrawal process and uh, that creates a, a two-year moratorium initially. Um, and that gives the Forest Service time to do a two-year study on the effects of, of, a, of a longer moratorium. There's, that would uh, put in place a 20-year moratorium, depending on the decision that comes out of that study. Um, and then what we're talking about here, about 125,000 acres of the Superior National Forest. And uh, this, this area in question is located within the Kawishui River watershed. And that's just upstream of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. Um, and it's within the headwaters of the much larger Rainy River watershed. This was a tragic incident on Wednesday morning. Uh, this was, uh, we were getting very close to deadline when this uh, suddenly occurred. Um, and uh, it left a Lake Vermilion resident dead and her husband in a critical condition after their house exploded um, due to causes that were still not confirmed as a press time. I mean, typically these uh, types of uh, explosions take place uh, as a result of propane leaks, but uh, we'll have to wait uh, to see what the fire marshal uh, determines here. The explosion was incredibly strong. Um, it shook homes as much as a mile away. I talked to some neighbors who were several uh, you know, houses away and and they said it was the loudest explosion they'd ever heard. I mean, they thought it was an earthquake at first. I mean, they didn't know what was going on. Um, and uh, yeah, so it uh, also it blew parts of the house into neighboring yards. I mean, I, I went out to the scene shortly after and, and uh, you know, there were parts of windows and doors and glass everywhere. 
you know, in neighboring yards. I mean, it, it was a, a impressive blast. There's no doubt about it. Um, and a husband and wife, Michael and Eva Grams, uh, were home at the time of the explosion. And uh, having been out there, I'm, I'm amazed that anybody survived. We're following this labor dispute at the Arrowhead Regional Library System, and it could lead to a strike of some uh, staff with the system, uh, depending on uh, whether they uh, vote down a contract offer. Uh, that vote was set for, for today, Friday, but um, we'll probably wait uh, till next week to find out the results. Uh, now, AFSCME uh, Council 65 represents the local union, and they, they cover staff members who work in the library system's administrative office in Mountain Iron. And uh, staff have been working under a contract that expired at the end of 2019. And now members are set to vote uh, on this. Um, it's the last and final offer which the uh, administration of the library system has made. And, uh, and so we'll see what they do. Uh, any staff walkout will not impact individual libraries within the seven county system but it could affect other programming such as the bookmobile um, and the mail a book programs. Now, both of those uh, offerings are very popular. I know up in our area where residents often live many miles from a library. Um, negotiations have dragged on for about two years now um, in part due to COVID which had kind of prevented you know, negotiating teams from meeting face to face. Um, but that means union members have been stuck at a, without a pay increase since 2019. And uh, at the same time, the library system has struggled to increase its own funding levels um, at a time when participating counties are focused on other priorities. The Northland Foundation recently released its annual report touching on everything from the pandemic to efforts to reduce the child care shortage in our region. Almanac North producer Greg Grell spoke with the foundation's president and CEO, Tony Sertich, about the impact of the pandemic on their work and reported highlights. Well, it was an incredibly busy year this year with a lot of our response to COVID. Uh, for a second year in a row, uh, we were able to distribute almost $10 million across all of our programming across our region. And just to put that in a little bit of perspective, we gave out a, over 600 grants this year, which is about uh, three times the amount of grants we give out in any year. And it was almost four to five times as amount of funding that we've given out in any year. So incredibly busy trying to be responsive uh, to the community, especially in this time of COVID. So since the pandemic, how has that changed kind of the focus of what you do at the Northland Foundation? Well, we still focus a lot on children, youth, and families, and individual and community well-being. But really, we've targeted a lot of our grant making in three key priority areas. And the first is in response to COVID. Uh, so many nonprofits really struggling first with the transition to how to be remote and then not and kind of living in this hybrid world. And so making targeted grants to nonprofits that are really in our focus area. The second was around supporting our businesses really in two key ways. Number one, we're administering a lot of the state programs. The state and federal government have passed you know, trillions of dollars and we've received a portion of that funding to provide grants to small businesses to really help them out in this time. And then we also are the hosts of the Small Business Development Center for our region. Some people might know it by the SBDC title and that's uh, no charge business consulting services to small businesses. And so we've done a lot of that work, helped over a thousand small businesses on everything to what's their HR policy? How can we transition to more uh, pay that is remote? and uh, really letting folks live in this, whatever this new normal is gonna be. Now, you mentioned that you do get some funding that you pass through, but there's a lot of uh, individual and other support. Talk a little bit about where the Northland Foundation support comes from. Yes, and so uh, we have an endowment, uh, which we take interest earnings on to, uh, to support our programming. We have a lot of partners uh, and some of the larger partners are the McKnight Foundation, which is a large uh, Minnesota-based foundation that really helped us get started 35 years ago. Uh, many other foundations, but really the state and federal government has been a strong partner of us. They've seen us as a regional player as we serve the five or the seven counties and five native nations in our region and seen us as a good regional partner to deliver resources, whether it be to help nonprofits, to help businesses, and then of course, uh, to help our childcare providers and families. 
Now you mentioned, mentioned Indigenous and you do have a program now that you started recently, an Indigenous led program. Tell our viewers about that. Absolutely. We're really excited about this. And that was launched this year. It's called Mata Uking, and that's an Ojibwe word for the distribution. And what we've seen nationally in Minnesota and even in our region is there's not a lot of support for indigenous led organizations, our native nations and folks doing work uh, within, with our indigenous community. And so we wanted to up our game in that and develop better relationships. And so we reached out to the five uh, tribal nation leaders and have been discussing how we can do a better job uh, with our work in partnership with them. And we put together a process design group. Each uh, tribal nation identified somebody to serve and found some other in urban indigenous leaders to really tell us how can we do better? And what they came up with was three main things. Number one, uh, because there's not a lot of indigenous led, indigenous focused nonprofits in our region, we developed a way to give individual grants to people that are doing really grassroots efforts. Uh, they're doing this sort of work uh, on their own, out of their own pocket, and we're gonna help support them, support indigenous communities. So grassroots grant, grant making is number one. Number two is really uh, the indigenous education programs in our school districts. Is there more we could do to help support and bolster uh, so they can tell their story, not just their history and their culture and tradition, which is important, but what's going on today and into the future. And then the third piece is economic development. We're working directly with those tribal nations and individual indigenous entrepreneurs to see what we can do to support their work. Now, I know uh, one of your main focuses in recent, recent years has been trying to increase the amount of child care that's available in our region. How is that going? That's a, that's a big issue for us. Absolutely. And so that is one of our key points. And we've worked a lot during uh, this time of COVID. Uh, Governor Walls actually met with us and other foundations like us in greater Minnesota at the start of this pandemic and said, is there anything you could do in the short term uh, to help child care providers? And we were able to raise some outside resources to give some stopgap grants because child care providers were hit and devastated around COVID because they had to do a lot more cleanliness and trying to figure out uh, how to keep kids safe. A lot of folks were keeping their kids home, so that was impacting their bottom line. Uh, and so, and they were already under stress because it's such a hard uh, business to be in in the first place. And so we started with some of that stopgap funding. We do a lot of childcare trainings and provide scholarships to families. Uh, and so the, the, I guess the good news is we were making progress. We are still a lot of spots short of having access to childcare for families. Uh, COVID certainly didn't help that. We, we went a little bit backwards and we're we're hitting about even, we still have this big gap, uh, but we're really redoubling our efforts. And we're gonna be hosting a virtual uh, conference coming up here next month. And it doesn't matter if you're a community leader, if you're a child care provider, if you're a family that needs child care, uh, we wanna bring everybody to the table because there's no silver bullet to solve this crisis and the system is broken. But child care providers are the businesses that help other businesses stay in business. And we all uh, need to support child care because when you're looking at workforce challenges in our communities, when you're looking at attracting people to our region, one of the first questions is, who's going to be taking care of my kids? And so we need an answer to that question. And so there's economic reasons uh, for this to be an issue for anybody in our community. And we're going to stay at the forefront of investing in child care. And uh, speaking of businesses, of course, you do a lot to, to support local businesses, both startups and existing businesses. Talk a little bit about the, the Northlands Foundation role in uh, the business community. Yes, we have a two-tiered approach to helping with our business services. The first is we have a loan program where we'll work with businesses and bankers in particular to take some of the risk and gap financing that happens. And so say a business goes to a bank, they want to either start up or expand, and it's a little too risky for the bank to, to give a full loan. We'll come in and provide that gap finance. And so that's one piece of that. And we did about uh, 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 nine loans uh, during COVID, about half were startup, half were expansions, growing jobs, growing our main street business economy across our region. And then the other half is, as I said, we are now the hosts of the Small Business Development Center, the SBDC. And so we have business consultants located all across our region uh, who are ready at the drop of the hat to talk with folks who are either starting up or expanding at no charge to the business, work on their business plan, work on their marketing, work on their HR. And we helped over a thousand businesses last year, uh, not just in this time of COVID, but some are starting up in this economy as well. You know, this is the time where people I think are rethinking what the future is for, for themselves in their work, in their life. And so some people are saying, you know, I might quit my job and try to start a new business. Well, we have services at no cost to them to help them think through uh, if that's a good idea and connect them to other resources. And all they got to do is go to our website, northlandsbdc.org, 
they can sign up and get connected with a business consultant. And uh, finally, Tony, uh, the uh, name of the foundation's annual report this year, Seeds of Growth. Do you see uh, a lot of positivity and a lot of good signs heading forward in the Northland? You know, I can't help but be optimistic. You know, this is a rough patch that we've all gone through both personally and uh, in all aspects of our life. But I think I see light at the end of the tunnel. And even in these rough times, people stepped up and people stepped out. And you can look at the frontline workers, you can look at community leaders, but you can also look at successful stories of people who pivoted on their business and, and are thinking of, way, of doing things in a new way. And I can't help but love this region that I grew up in. Uh, this, this is the place where, where I went to, to school and have decided to live. We have amazing quality of life and people are rethinking, where am I gonna live? Where am I gonna work? So many more people are working remotely. We have so much to offer people if we can take care of some of these fundamental issues. And so I'm hopeful for the future of our region and we're gonna be a strong partner with whomever wants to make our region brighter and thrive. Well, Tony Sertix, president of the Northland Foundation, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Craig. Well, that's our time this week, but you can keep up with our latest posts by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Check out the WDSE website for program updates, news about the station and upcoming events, and download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs anytime you please. And Denny, I'm looking forward to some spookiness this Halloween. I have great memories as a child at Halloween. I yeah. enjoy it. <laughs> I, I enjoy it too. My mom used to let us just run for hours yep. and miles. But, we did the uh, same thing. I don't think they do that anymore. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. With Dennis Anderson, I'm Julie Zenner. We'll see you next time.